this is uh, yeah, a thing we call browser solidity, and it's a fully functional IDE which uh, does not require you to install anything, it just it runs directly from the browser. It is even able to run in an offline context, so it does not have to uh, yeah, load uh, stuff from the internet. And the, you can find it at the following URL. Okay, that's actually not the URL, that's the offline version I saved. Okay, um, and yes, yeah, so it's it's divided into two parts. On the left side, uh, you see the the editor with multiple tabs, um, and on the right side, you see uh, automatically generated information about the contract you're currently writing. And let's start with a simple contract. That's just a contract which has a variable and a function, and you can use the function set the variable. Um, here on the right side, uh, you see the currently loaded compiler, which is uh, 0.44. Using this dropdown, you can change it to an older compiler version. Uh, this goes back to, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so for 0.11, we don't even have a date. Um, it, it's a bit confusing because that is not the active version. Uh, if you want to see the current version, you have to look here. Um, and if autocompile is, is ticked here, then it automatically compiles with every keystroke, basically. Uh, if you disable that, then you can click the button to compile. And the compilation result here is an entry for each contract. Um, you get information about the of the bytecode. You can copy that. The that's the the JSON ABI interface that you have to you can use that if you want to interface with your contract using Web3.js. Um, and then here's a JavaScript snippet you can use. You can paste into the Go Ethereum console to deploy the contract. And that's another snippet that is useful in other contexts. Um, you can even get a lot more details by clicking this button here. Um, it gives you a list of functions and their signatures or their, their, their identifiers, the hashes of the signatures. Uh, what is very important is you also get gas estimations here. So creation costs 57 gas plus 30,600. Um, one of them is the gas required to run the constructor function, and the other one is the gas required to deploy the code. Um, yes, and then gas estimates for all the functions. These are upper bounds, um, which means that they are not always accurate, and especially if you put a loop inside a function or something which is a bit more complex, then you will get uh, infinity as an upper bound. Um, another thing I have to say here is that they, these gas estimates do not reflect the recent hard fork gas changes, so we still have to update those. Um, yeah, then runtime bytecode is the bytecode that will be deployed in the blockchain. Then the same, the full code is a list of opcodes, and the full code as assembly which is sometimes also quite useful, especially because you have the, so on the right-hand side, so on the left-hand side, there's always the, the, the instructions, and on the right-hand side, you see the part of the source this instruction was generated from. Okay, let's untoggle the details. Yeah, and then also very important, Below the compilation results, uh, you have a list of errors and warnings. If I put garbage inside here, then I will get a compiler error. And we should actually respect that warning. Um, it says 
we do not specify the version of the compiler required. Let's add that here. Yep. Now it's, so there's no warning. You should always try to create source code without warning because most of the warning, so we, we try to be really, um, we, we try to generate as few warnings as possible and if there's a warning, then it's usually quite severe. And any warning that is generated by the compiler can be silenced by some way. So as an example, if you use the send uh, function, Okay, that's a stupid example, but uh, it just sends one way to the address zero. And there will be a warning that, the, that we ignore the return value of this function. And if you, if you really know, yes, I really want to ignore the return value, then you could do something like, like this. And then the warning silenced. Okay, um, that was the compiler part of the IDE, um, but that's only one tiny aspect of it. And much more interesting is the um, kind of the the blockchain simulator that is part of the IDE. And you can click this red create button to create the contract, which does not work now. Let's see. <laughs> Okay, let's try an older compiler. <coughs> no. Okay, um, as I said, this yeah, that looks better. Okay, um, and so this, this creates the contract at this address in memory, which means it's just a simulated blockchain, and you have buttons for all the functions in, in the contract. Um, functions that are constant, which means that they, they do not have side effects, are evaluated immediately, and you get the, the result here. So that's the value of the, of the x variable. Uh, you get statistics about the actual transaction cost of this specific invocation and not the, the upper bound, and a decoder result. And then you can, yeah, invoke functions that make changes to the state. Okay, um, so I called F with uh, 34. The result is the empty string, which is fine because it doesn't return anything. And yeah, we have the guest codes here again. And now we can click the X button again to check the updated value. And it correctly results in 34. Okay, um, one thing to consider or to yeah remember is that the the input boxes here always require proper JSON, which means um, if you have a large number here, then this won't work. But what you can do is you can uh, put them, you can basically hex encode them, for example, and then it will work. And you have to put, put quotes around it. So this is basically, uh, the stuff you enter here is directly forwarded into the Web3.js uh, encoder. Okay, what else do we have? Um, there are some tabs here, which I want to explain quickly. Uh, here you can change the transaction origin. If you want to test a contract that has to be invoked from different addresses, then you, you get uh, five preset addresses here. You can modify the gas limit and you can send ether together with a function call. So if you set it here, then uh, it will be valid uh, until you change it again. And 
You can also use browser solidity to interface with other blockchains than the simulated. And that's done using the third tab here. Um, if you load browser solidity from within Mist, for example, then you can click on Injected Web3 and you get the Web3.js that is available inside Mist, so you directly interface with the attached node. Or you can use uh, yeah, Web3 Provider, which means that uh, it tries to connect to, to this address using JSON RPC, and it doesn't work because I don't have a node running here. Oh yeah, one, one, one important thing here, if you load the website from HTTP, HTTPS over SSL from GitHub, then this doesn't work because browsers do not allow non-encrypted requests from encrypted websites. So you have to load it from, from non-SSL GitHub. Okay, then on, on this tab you can uh, publish your, the source code uh, you have here as, uh, yeah, yeah, on GitHub, or <laughs> You can copy it over to another instance of, of the IDE. And on this tab, you get an interface to the debugger, which Jan will talk about later. And we have another tab, which allows formal <coughs> verification of contracts. Um, Yuichi will give a talk about formal verification, but it will be about bytecode level formal verification, whereas uh, this module here is used uh, for source code level verification. And then the question mark here takes you to the Solidity documentation. Okay, that's all I wanted to talk about the IDE. If there are any short questions, I can take them. Otherwise, uh, I think Jan could show the debugger. Yes, so another question, just as a compliment, because I've been using that a lot in the last two, three months, and it's really great. So Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I think one last week or two weeks ago, we added actual uh, browser unit testing per pull request, which will result in this website breaking much less. <laughs> so it, it's quite complicated to do browser testing because it has to load the compiler, which is an 80 megabytes file, and usual. So the these hosted services for testing, can't really cope with that, so, yeah. Okay, 